Thank you. And I will talk about of the uh, ABI. In this session, I want to mention some points that are important to validate an ABI in the kernel module, in the kernel side, for the kernel ABI, and for, in general, binary applications. Okay, an ABI, uh, we found the definitions for the interfaces between two binary programs. I think in the kernel, it helps to validate when both different versions of the kernel is compatible or incompatible. And uh, with the modules, we can validate when a module built in a specific version of the kernel is <laughs> compatible when we try to load with another uh, version of the kernel. Mm -hmm. There is an <clears throat> to specialize it to validate the compatibility across the binary applications. That is tool is Lifabigail. <laughs> and now we have the implementation for a new debug format that is an alternative to Dwarf. And it's in charge to extract the ABI type information for function not symbols. It is able to use some utilities to serialize the representation of the ABI in an XML format. It has also uh, the tools to compare the, and summarize the changes. Works for binary files, but it has support for read and understand some different type of the uh, package, Linux packages, including RPMs in Debian packages. <clears throat> With this tool, we detect kernel ABI, uh, sorry, ABI breakage in the libraries. And we also have, um, and with this tool, we'll have checked and verified the backward compatibility with new version libraries. Mm -hmm. The main inputs that the LibAbigail Liba understand as the, is the dwarf format, but now it has the support to the CTF. <coughs> and since the VM Linux is a uh, L file, it's able to extract the information and build the kernel ABI that it uh, conforms with the binary files. And the, sorry, the VM Linux uh, image and the uh, KO files, the modules. Mm -hmm. The CTF information, what is the CTF? CTFs, it's a uh, debug format that associate the symbols with its type. It was thinking to be a lightweight debug format. So it is embedded in the L file and uh, uh, utilities like Strip was thinking to B, uh, to keep on touch the CTF section, that is the place when we save the CTF information, remain in the original file. Mm -hmm. the, the book information is organized in the archive and dictionaries. These are the two main entities of this uh, format. Bas basically, the archive is a container of dictionaries. The CTF format, <coughs> all the Symbol information in the VM Linux is in the VM, in the Linux compilation is on the VM Linux CTF archive, and the option that we have to generate the information of CTF is by using the modifier CTF in the GCC. The implementation is in the Leaf CTF library, which uh, relies, which uh, currently is the version three. Okay. Mm, this is an example of the CTS, how we can analyze the CTF information. The most important line is the we have the symbol type definition for the pin K, and this is the format. It consists in identifier, an identifier, the um, signature of the function, and the int, the value, the return value. This picture, <clears throat> in this picture, I want to show how LeFabigail now support the CTF. Basically, we add a new reader that implements the, fun the same functionality that the dwarf reader, but now it relies in the Leaf CTF to understand the CTF information built 
a corpus in this corpus contains the type babes, type base, yeah. And for binary applications, for libraries, or just all the global symbols are represented in the ABI, but in the kernel side, <coughs> just the exported symbol are in the archive, sorry, in the representation. We can use the CTF corpus to serialize, to save the, the representation, or we can use an external represent an external tools to compare the difference of the ABI, and or use the tools by default that it's in in Diff Abigail, the, the Diff reader. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Diff Abigail, what now has the support in those different tools? The ABI does a write represent they were represent the ABI in an XML file. The diff compute and summarize the difference between two, two different files, two binary files. In package diff, it works with directories and complex files. The kernel module interface compare uh, two um, kernel binaries. Uh, sorry, este, build, build, build kernel directories, but using the uh, corporate representation. As an example of this, we have the first source code. And to generate the representation, we have we need to have the CTF modifier that generates the CTF information. And what is mentioned here that both binary both both the formats can live in the same binary. Mm -hmm. This is an XML representation of the ABI by using the CTF. Uh -huh. This is the example, the second source that we will compare and, and get the difference. <laughs> the command lines now with the support of the CTF to extract the information. The, the first line using ABI data writer is used to extract the, the ABI representation. After that, we can use uh, the ABI diff, that is the default program that is used <coughs> to compute the difference, so we can use an external program, but relaying in the uh, previous work that, previous file that was output by data writer. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an example of the representation of the ABI, sorry, for the output of the difference. This is the support, this picture shows the support that we are asked to understand the CTF and the kernel and generate the kernel ABI representation. Uh, as per said, we need uh, 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 CTF, so a uh, kernel that supports the CTF. <coughs> it generates uh, the VM Linux .ctf a that it's uh, that it's the archive that contains all the type simple information for the kernel and its module. And after that, we can use the NVR data writer to generate an XML representation. And this XML representation can be used uh, for ABA data writer, data tip, sorry, and generate the, the report of the difference. The leaf ABIL also provides the kernel module information different that is all the, the summarize or simplify some, some steps to compute the kernel difference. <clears throat> this is the uh, commands and <clears throat> configuration of the kernel and the CTF uh, uh, target to, to build the uh, BM Linux CTF archive. And this is the command lines <clears throat> that you use to compare both uh, kernel, kernel uh, directories and the performance uh, these um, measurements <coughs> is a significant uh, significant improvement when we are comparing the CTF uh, versus dwarf to build a representation of the an ABI it's taking one minute one minute with 70 seconds and for the in, in Dwarf, is taking four minutes, 47 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Three quick summaries of that. Mm -hmm. 
brief question, if I may. Uh, the uh, CPF output is rather odd because the real time is far more than the sum of user and sys. I've got to wonder where the remaining 40 or 50 seconds is going. It, it, it's not sys calls and it's not in user space, so where, so where is it? <laughs> I mean, for, for dwarf, it's pretty clearly the sum, but something odd is going on. Um. Uh, wouldn't IO show? Oh, oh just, just completely blocked on IO for that long. That's very strange. I should try this. <laughs> Some, they should, they shouldn't be that much IO to thought. Maybe, oh, was it the first one you ran? Maybe this cache was cold and it was walking over the di directory tree and taking ages doing that. Yeah. It may, it might, it, in, 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 if that's the case, we may well find that it only takes 15 seconds with the, uh, with the hot cache. Maybe. Yeah, it's, uh, should try be running it. Uh, anyway, Sorry, um, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the the for algorithm that is implemented in the diff, different tool that is used by the Leaf Abigail, <coughs> it's taken. Uh, too much time to compute the, those difference. So the algorithm is LCS and it would be nice to have uh, the infrastructure to install the different algorithm here and a custom algorithm can reuse, this custom algorithm can reuse the work that it's done by the ABI diff <coughs> because it uh, extract the city the, the book information for the world but there's no way to to uh, use or remove this algorithm and install a new one and in this way create a new uh, other format for the report so the google people uh, takes the address to build from scratch the, this part of the code, this part, this, this uh, algorithm, and <laughs> take the uh, the output for the ABI data writer. But is is this actually the reason why Google developed their own diffing program? Because one part is performance, right? I guess I don't know. And the other part is that why is the Libra Big Air default diff algorithm not? Uh, ideal for comparing the Android kernels. Right. Uh, the, the diff algorithm was originally developed after we developed, uh, sorry, we wanted to experiment with BTF. So we had an intern write a BTF reader from scratch. And then we had the choice of either integrating that into LibAbigail or writing our own diff tool. Mm -hmm. And it was deemed to be a lot less work to write our own diff. And that's the point at which the algorithm was developed. And it turned out to be quite performant. So we decided eventually after about a year to actually use it in production and make it quality and add an XML reader. To answer the question. Okay, so performance is part of it. Yes, I mean, we will use STG diff in preference to LibAbigail for performance reasons. Yes, that is part of it. And uh, how do you see, what are the perspectives of getting your diff algorithm incorporated in the Lipa Big uh, Like making the library to support custom or different different algorithms. You know the internals of Lipa Big much better than I do. Yeah, um, so I, 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 I have tried but failed to integrate my algorithm into Lipa Big It's, yeah. But still for the corpus generation, you use Lipa Big Yes. I don't know, okay. yes. So what constitutes the ABI is, is, is Lipa Bigail that decides it, right? At the moment, yes. Okay. And this table shows the performance between Dwarf and CTF, but now with all other packages in the distribution, as you can see there is always an improvement by using the at least the reader. <laughs> and in the second column, I use the div, but the part of the extract, extract the CTF information is the same algorithm <coughs> comparing with Dwarf. So in all other differs, we are using the CTF uh, reader. 
And this is an example <coughs> of the breakage on the ABI for on the kernel. This I, uh, it, it function, it function, the export a functionality inside of the kernel. After that, <coughs> we create a client modules that utilize this functionality. Yeah. All the on the find all the uh, symbols defined on the export export symbol are marked of on, on the find because it will be resolved when the kernel is loaded. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> here install the mode with the first version and it's success because it's built across the same uh, version of the kernel. But in this case, we add a uh, read-only attribute that it's in the first parameters and let's see <coughs> why this kernel is incompatible and the first I uh, show the assembly code that looks without any change uh, I test using the build the representation of the ABI to figure out if there is if Abigail detects the, the change and it's return zero meaning that there is no change in the ABI. Okay, I use poke with this script to compare every section on the executable file. Uh, it seems that it, it says that there is no, no, no difference. Okay. So, uh, so, so the issue here is the, the kernel relies to be loaded in the CRC, that is the JKSIM tool. These tools <clears throat> compute the CRC by using the uh, tokens that uh, conforms the, uh, the symbols. And this uh, CRC is different. It's different from the, between the two different versions of the kernel. But TTF could help to validate this. Uh, sorry, Guillermo. So this was an example where you get a false positive. Yeah. Right? Using these uh, Gen K sims. Yeah. So Lip Big I'll say that there was not API breakage. And yeah. that was correct. Uh -huh. Okay, just to be clear. So that attribute is not is not breaking the ABI. No. Okay. Not breaking the ABI, but in the kernel I it refused to install. Uh, just a side note, we, we see this um, quite on a, on a weekly basis when we get LTS mergers from, from upstream into the Android kernels. We see these kind of false positives. Uh, we, we come to terms that, that Gen K Sims is um, um, rather conservative in these kind of things. So, for example, um, we have regularly ABIs where you have um, pointer structures um, which are basically opaque, so they should not affect the, the ABI, um, even if the underlying data types uh, changes. Yet, um, things like you add and include, adds the full definition of that type, and in theory, the interface that uses the, this type um, has access to the, to, to the full um, data type. Now, in this case, in, in order to keep in, in a stable ABI, and um, a module would not load with the CRC change that is there, uh, we actually like basically if they have those changes safely annotating them and that's how we keep the the kernel api for for android stable while, keep, while still um, uh, ingesting uh, ETS uh, mergers from upstream by marking or basically documenting this uh, change is safe and uh, gen casems please ignore for example an include like if the include comes in uh, we just do if not def uh, gen casems include uh, and if and then basically we ignore the actual include so that the crc remains stable so in this case we would basically uh, put this attribute addition in an if def uh, so that gen casems does not see it and uh, the crc would be stable the feature is still in because we know that is a stable change so just like an insight how we how we deal with these kind of things because we see them on a weekly basis roughly yeah, I have heard of other people actually having those problems. I think okay. in Oracle as well, in the, the kernel team. So.
Mm. So well, the, but, but Lieber Bigail got it right. What we, what we added to Lieber Bigail is actually that uh, CLC changes are considered part of the ABI, so it will report the CLC change and flag it as a, as a breakage. Because in fact, when you try to load that module, the CLC change will cause, will cause it to be denied. So you have to fix that. If the kernel will not accept it. To answer the other person back there, Live Abigail doesn't consider a change from a forward declaration to a fully defined type or vice versa to be an ABI change. So it doesn't report them, it doesn't care about them. Um, so the prop it doesn't report the breakage, if you like, if there is a breakage, but the, the CRCs will change. Yeah. I should note on that front that the CTF generated CTF will fuse uh, forward declarations to their and to, uh, convert them to a real type whenever possible, even if the real type is not actually visible in the scope in, in the scope in question. On the basis that the debugging format format and people would generally want to see the full structure full structure definitions. Where, you, where it will leave a forward in place instead is if, if that structure has multiple definitions in different places, which is probably the exact situation in which you'd want to not have it say only one structure is valid. So it's possible that it might report an ABI change even if one specific user could not see the full structure. Because if there's only one instance of that structure and it has changed, it might have been digging around in there when it wasn't allowed to um, and always have been working and now that might have broken. We could have an option to prevent it from doing that sort of progressive fusion, but at the moment, no, no one suggested it to me. Yeah, in, in recent days, we also like we, we see a similar issue in, in, in that Android kernel. Like we have um, some compilation units have a forward declarations, um, multiple uh, compilation units see a full definition of that, and just the way Dwarf is organized um, makes it very hard, or it makes it very easy to hide information from the Webigel. So CTF is, a, is an opportunity to make it uh, easier for LibAvigate to, to track these things down. Um, yeah, the, the, the problem is also like in C, you don't have ODR. So a same definition is, uh, it, it, it's, it's a more difficult decision to decide whether uh, the same definition is actually the same definition and to combine them and whether a forward declaration corresponds to that actual um, um, full definition. So it is, it is a decision that is harder in C than in C++. Yeah. Um, so like, there's there's no real blame in the Abigail, especially when it has to deal with with, with dwarf. So CDF is certainly a chance if you if you can um, do many more of these deduplications and fusions in yeah. at, the, at the compiler level, where we have much more um, insight. We use a recursive hashing strategy to determine whether types are identical, much the same as SD, SDG does. What? Oh, sorry, the two far away. Um, we use a recursive hash hashing strategy to um, determine whether types are identical, much like SD SDG does. Um, mm -hmm. The name of the structure is part of its hash. So if the name changes, we will say this structure has changed, which is probably what is desired. <laughs> but so is the sizes and all the types it depends on and so on and so forth. Yeah, there, there are also more complications if, it, uh, if you add um, more fun to the game like LTO. Um, where, where compilers have to deal with um, much more dwarf and have to produce an output that, that can be read. So there's certainly a lot of room to uh, yeah, hide information from the, from the tooling. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Uh, um, the CTFS is able to detect, to, to uh, compare in the bare way that just rely on the CRC. <laughs> if we compile the modules with the CTF modifiers and dump the, the module, we can see that undefined symbols in the three case has the same the same information. That that means that all the symbols are compatible. So the CRC, the kernel should be allowed to uh, safely load the module. Uh, and <clears throat> this fear tried to uh, explain how we can use in Linux utilities the int mode and move proof the ability to extract the information of the CTF 
and compare with the VM Linux CTFA that information in order to avoid and refuse to load a module that it's really compatible with the kernel. Because in that case, we can use safely the ignore mode version because the ABI is the same. Mm -hmm. It means that we need to store the CTF information in some place in the system. The uh, fingerprint in the size is almost the same size that we are using for uh, uh, save the symbol type definition for the binary. It's in compared with the dwarf, it's almost the three three times more time. Yeah, I should sorry. Sorry, I should note that the three hundred, the hundred percent on the yeah. previous page is of absolute worst case. Something that large only applies to an out of tree module. Uh, because that's, that's including all the common types in the core kernel that that module is using. For modules that are, are in, in tree, it's going to be a few kilobytes to nothing. Um, the, um, that's, a, that's the largest CDF I've ever seen for USB core by about a factor of 200k. Uh, if you built an in-tree module, you would see much better sizes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another user case <coughs> in which uh, these tools are not able to detect the ABI breakage. That happens when we use the uh, attributes. For instance, this is a library that we that we build by using the CTF information and DOF information. We explicitly change the ABI. For in when we execute the both tools compiles the 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 client of the applications and yep compile the client application and let's see how the arguments now are updated that means that the ABI was updated Poco detects that there is a change in the ABI sorry in the binary file but it's not sure if this uh, change of the ABI, <laughs> but in the line 16 to 20, we are using the ABI diff to detect so change, but it says that it's really compatible. But when we try to execute, it really shows a segmentation fault in the second case because it's not compatible with the previous version. Mm -hmm. There are some other attributes that update the ABI, but that's not safe in the, any place in the L file. And it should be, would be a nice to have a <coughs> section that save the ABI in uh, some place. And that's our some example. Yeah. Uh, so the calling convention is not visible in the dwarf anywhere, or is it just not picked up by the ABI tooling? That's when you change to the Microsoft ABI, Ah, it, does that change the dwarf at all? No, no, not no. at all. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other question? I think uh, we, we had, I think a couple of years we had uh, also somebody saying, "Yeah, what if the calling convention changes?" And I think we came to the we came to the mode. Okay, we we try to be defensive uh, by not changing these kind of things, because changing an entire, like, changing the compiler to a chain and everything is a change that should be caught in a review. I'm not sure it's, it's well, something. It happens. I can tell you it happened yeah. last week. I, I was, I was curious why such changes really like, like in, a, in like, we are, like for, for the case that, that we are mostly care about is a, a release branch should not change. We are not like tracking mainline for, for ABI changes. We say this is released and any subsequent security or like updates, patches should not break whatever we have. So um, we would not touch the, the, the tool chain, for example, significantly enough to even get close to calling convention changes. Like why would it happen? I'm curious. <laughs> I think the general point here 
in my opinion, is that for whatever reason, people are getting interested nowadays in things like ABI breakages and to check for it, like you people do with the Android kernels, right? Now, tools like Liba Bigail, they use the bug info as the base to try to extract, right? To synthesize ABI, the ABI information, whatever that is, because I guess that depending on the ABI checking tool, the ABI means one thing or another, right? I don't think there is consensus actually to what particularly defines the ABI of, 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 of a module. So now the question I think, Guillermo, correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess that here the question is, is, is the back info only, considering that the back info is generated for different purposes, enough to do what you want to do, for example, with the comparing the kernel three ABIs when you release, you do a new release or not? And if it's not enough, what should we do? Should we extend and expand the debug info with additional things? Or should we introduce something else? Or maybe some else section with additional annotations or, or what? I guess that's the discussion, right? I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very much interested in, in, in seeing whether we can uh, even use CTF or whatever it, the, the best solution might be to um, embed ABI relevant information, including the type information deduplicated so that it can be extracted. We don't have to go to way through Dwarf, for example, and that these things can be like, what is relevant to the ABI should be in that section. Like if it yeah, changes, but... it should be there. And it should not be, like, you should not do detective work to find it from, from debug information. Yeah. So, do you, so do you think that the back uh, info is the place where to have that information? I think similar to or... how you put um, the, the ARM architecture or like x86, whatever architecture that binary is built for, um, it's, it's also part of the ABI, right? You would not expect an ARM binary to work right away out of the box with or ABI compatible to x86 either. One of the examples Guillermo gave had shows, in, shows an interesting problem as well. So I'm thinking of adding lots and lots of attribute recording to CTFB4 when I eventually work on it. But one of those section is particularly interesting because is a change of section an ABI break? It depends on the loader, it depends on the application, it depends on which section it is moving from and which section it's moving to. Uh, optimization will often split functions and move and move pieces of them into other sections, but that's not an ABI change. Um, it, uh, in, in this case, what might make a section move an ABI change is that the kernel loader will only consider something to be callable if it appears in one section. But that's up to the kernel loader and the compiler tool team and, and LibAbigail don't know that. We may need something else to indicate to LibAbigail moves to and from this section indicate an ABI change in some way. This changes of the section in which things are located may or may not be problematic. And there may be other attributes with similar um, similar concerns, I think. When there is an ABI breakage, sorry. Oh, uh, um, when there is an ABI breakage, um, in the report that you get, you are expecting to actually find references to source constructions, right? That you can actually mm. refer to. And maybe I am not getting your comments right. Oh, yeah. So the thing is that, if some given function get in line, or well, if it get in line, yeah, okay, that's a different thing, but it's split it or something, right? Sure. So I guess that the the ABI breakage it should always be related to some source level construction that the programmer can. It could, it could, it, it's just as possible that, for example, something moved from one section to another because you had a broken tool chain or a sudden upgrade of a compiler to something that was generating incompatible output. It may still be an ABI project, but you might not be able to point at a specific source line that changed. There may not be an attribute section. It might just have stuffed the output in a different section. It's still an ABI breakage. Well, yeah, there are cases. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's too much, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the course of the last years where we actually stabilized or like created that, that kind of ecosystem with stable ABIs, we had different use cases. In the first, we had like um, um, largely uh, incompatible kernels where differences were like 
pages and pages of, of, of report and uh, we try to like, how do we converge to a stable AI? Nowadays, we say, okay, start with a stable one and, and do your things. So our reports are usually fitting on in 50 lines and we try to make it very, very actionable and changes are incremental. So if you have the holistic picture, whatever whatever is participating in, in the ABI, you will usually be able to pinpoint very quickly where it comes from. Um, is there a source code change? Is there a tool chain uh, change? So you, even even if it's like a, it's a calling convention change, I mean, yes, it can say something is odd, something is different, but at the same point, source control should tell you that there is a tool chain change as part of whatever contributes to the ABI. And similarly, there's a source code change. It might be a bit um, more involved if you have mergers where a lot of changes come in, but even then, bisection should help you to, to, to pinpoint it to a reasonable amount of code or reasonable, reasonable amount of changes that eventually lead you to making this report actionable. Yeah. So and I think these two, do, two, two, two models um, are quite interesting, like converging on the one hand side, but starting from a stable uh, point of view is, is, an, is another model. And that, for that part, it, it worked quite well to have just actionable reports and small and usually be, we are able to just say which structure, even, if, even without telling which file. Uh, that that's like line and file information is not so important if it's like very like a, a structure that you change, especially if you have that the code changes attend. Is this working again? Yeah. yeah. So um, I've always wondered whether we should be storing section information in AVIs, but people who seem to know more about this, like Matthias, have said, don't bother. It only matters whether it's a function or data. Uh, I don't, you know, trust the link loader uh, for the particular application, whether it's kernel or whether it's, you know, user space. Um, so we haven't done it. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I'll note the comment about, I think you had a slide maybe two slides ago about attributes in particular whether functions are no return. Probably a uh, couple different use cases for downstream tools to know if that's the case. Um, don't worry about. Okay, yeah, it looks good in the live stream. Um, we might have a talk later in the day um, as well that might bring up similar points. So there might be more than one consumer than just the folks immediately interested in this talk. Of the metadata. Yeah, of this yeah. metadata, whether it's dwarf or elf or you know, it'd be nice to not have to pay for things if people aren't going to use them. But you know. It, interesting to multiple domains yeah. okay. and what about of, I know that it's enough to don't store the um, but the attributes that update the ABI but in the kernel uh, just rely the CRC to allow us that the module could be insert in the kernel but is the CRC change uh, can refuse even even that there is no changes in the executable files I think in this case it's just how gen KSIMS work works and it's basically um, pre-processing source code and um, seeing this extra string part of the type information creating a different hash that bubbles up to the CRC of that, that symbol and it's in the module it's in the kernel and they clash and it's just like you, you would need to address these kind of things in uh, in modern or the gen case sims that perhaps this mm -hmm. attribute is ignored and I'm not too much into the details of it. Perhaps there's even an, some sort of an ignore list where we can put these things on. Um, in the end of the day, we use the CRCs as um, a safety net because um, occasionally you, you miss that there is an, a change and um, you, you, you rather see um, something flagged than missed. So a CRC change is often pointing us to like, something is going on in this symbol, we should have another look. And even if we um, deliberately decide, okay, this is a safe change and we mark it as such, it's still better than having missed um, a possibly critical change. I just had another crazy idea. Uh, the, C um, the CTFD duplicator is already working by building by building recursive hash values for uh, for, for all the types. 
and it can perfectly easily combine all of the results to produce a, a single hash value for all the, for all the types in the entire well in the entire kernel in the entire whatever granularity you want to work at and feed that out somehow to build it into the hash for the um, for, for the uh, over for the overall system. What? Oh, it's still not that. Sorry. And build and feed it out somehow to build it into the hash of the overall system. And then Jink Sims would not need to hash the types at all uh, because the CTFD duplicator had already, had already been doing it. And then we could delete Jenkins Sims. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm having no uh, emotions about um, Gen K Sims. <laughs> Something like that. But of course, sometimes it is valuable to not hash some things. As you admit, the if def gen case and stuff is not there for no reason, so we might want something similar. So but you want to replace the hashes? It's just a mad idea. <laughs> I don't know if it makes sense. It might be we accept the hash. <laughs> Since we're already doing the hashing, <laughs> equally the, the STG approach is doing the same sort of hashing tricks, and it, or it could contribute a hash in the same sort of way. As Maybe. a contributor to a production C parser, I would. <laughs> Uh, welcome any ideas of how we might replace Gen K Sims <laughs> with literally anything, <laughs> anything else. Thanks to the speaker.